Hi there. In today's lecture, we're going to be looking at composition of functions. So a composition of functions is a way of combining two functions together using this operation given by the little circle. So it's very similar to how we would have an operation between two numbers, for example, addition. You take two numbers, you add them together, you get another number. Over here, we have two functions, we combine them together, and we get another function. Okay, so it's an operation between two functions. Sorry, between two functions. Okay, and this produces a third function, uh, let's call it h. Okay, so how is this defined? So let's say uh, we have our um, function g. So this goes from x to y with g. And then f, uh, just based on the definition we'll see now, goes from y to z. Okay. So we need to define this uh, chain of functions here. Um, we, so we write it out like this, and then we define this composition h as h of x. So h is a function that goes from x to z, like that. So it eats up an x element and produces a z element via these two functions. Okay, so the way we write it is uh, f composed with g, or f after g, uh, some people say. This is a function that eats up an x element, and we just define it like so. Okay, so we take g of x as the first step in the composition. So g eats up an x element, produces a y element. That's on the inside here. Then f eats up the y element and produces a z element. That's on the outside here. Okay, so we've got this nesting of functions here. Okay, so the innermost function that eats up the elements on the far left, it produces an output. That output is eaten up by the um, outer function and then so on through the chain up to the uh, last elements on the right hand side. Okay, so this nesting or composition behavior here uh, tells us how, uh, the order in which we go. So g gets evaluated first because that's the innermost function and then you go um, outside the nesting to the outermost function which we do uh, last. Okay, so what we're going to be interested in uh, for this lecture is looking at the domain and range um, of this composition. Okay, uh, notice here that y the set y here lies in the middle, okay? So from x we go to y, and y we go to z. So there needs to be some compatibility between g and f for this chain over here to make sense, right? Because y is shared between the two. So we need some sort of uh, compatibility behavior for that. And we'll see that uh, with regards to this g function, we need to put some restrictions on x, such that when that gets mapped to y, f can then eat up that element. We'll see that that uh, causes some problems uh, with these examples. Okay, so let's start off with our first example. Okay, so uh, this first example won't have that uh, compatibility problem that I was talking about, uh, but this is a good way to, to see what's going on. And then in the next example, I will introduce that problem. Okay, so we go from x to y to z, okay, like the chain we have above there. How do we do this? Uh, let's say we go from x uh, to an element y, we call uh, root x. And then from y, uh, we go to an element z, uh, we do that with sine of y. Okay, so again, x gets mapped into y using the root function, and then once you're in y, you get mapped to z using the 
sine function. Okay, so that's looking at them individually. What would this look like as a composition? Okay, so that's G, that's F. So let's say H of X, that's going to be F composed with G. That's going to eat up an X element. And by definition, we can write it as the nested function F composed with G. Again, G is on the inside, that does the first mapping, and then F, that's on the outside, that does the second mapping to get into Z. Okay, so what does this look like? We know what these two functions do. We've got root X for the inside part, sine of Y for the outside part, so this composition will be sine of root X. Okay, so what is the domain and range of this H function? Remember, this was H of X. Okay, so we'll look at it um, as G eating something from X, producing something in Y, then F eating that something from Y, and producing something in Z. Okay, so these X values that get eaten up by G, what are the restrictions on that? Well, we see that we've got this root function here, and we know that we cannot take the root of a negative real number. Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. So, for the input, we cannot have any negative values. We can only have positive values. So, here, x, that's the domain for g, which is also the domain for h. Remember, h is the overall composition. So this is going to be from zero, including zero, to infinity, um, not including infinity, of course. Okay. Now this root function takes in the zero to infinity and maps it to zero to infinity. That's the range of the root function. Okay, we looked at that in a previous lecture. Now, are there any issues with that, with the sine function? No, there's not because the sine function can take any real number. You can put negative numbers, zero, positive numbers, any real number, there's no problem at all. So if we only look at the sine function eating up positive values, or in this case non-negative values, um, there's no problem, right? Sine function can take anything. If we then restrict that, well, there's no problem because it could take anything. So here, there's no issue. So whatever the output for the root function is, that's perfectly fine as the input for the sine function. So here, y, that will be 0 to infinity. Okay. Now, sine will then eat up that value, that non-negative value from y, and produce something between minus 1 and 1. That's the range of the sine function. So z... This will go from minus 1 to 1. Okay, so if we look at h as a function by itself, we can ignore the middle bit. That was just an intermediate step. Going straight from x to z, we see that h has a domain x. So this is the domain of h. y was just an intermediate uh, set. And then z, that will be the um, target and in this case, the range as well of f. So here we can just look at the range, uh, sorry, the range of uh, f, which will then be the range of h. Okay, and this y, again, this was just intermediate. Okay. So this wasn't too bad. Uh, we only needed to worry about this root function uh, but the sine function we did not need to worry about. In this next example, we're going to swap sine and the root, and we'll see that this causes a bit more uh, of a problem for us. Okay, so next example. Okay, let's keep the same set structure. So x goes to y goes to z. Uh, but now we're going to swap the sine and the root. So here x... Uh, let's take this to sine x, um, and then y, let's take this to root y. Okay, so we're just swapping um, those two around. Okay, but again, 
from x to y, we do that with g. From y to z, we do that with f. Uh, but I've just redefined um, those functions there. Okay, so again, h of x, that's going to be f after g, or f composed with g, that eats up an x element. So by definition, this will be f, and then g inside, like that. Okay, but we know what those functions will be, so we can write them out nicely. Okay, so the outside function, that's f, that's given by the root. The inside function, that's g, that's given by sine. So we're going to have root sine x. Okay, um, and some of you will see uh, the issue here. With the roots on the outside, we know that the root function can only take in non-negative values. But if we look at this inside part, sine of x, well, that can be positive and it can be negative. So we're going to have issues with that. Okay, so let's look at the domain and range for the individual parts, and then we'll try and fix up the problem. Okay, so first let's ignore the composition and look at them individually, and then we'll see how do we fix the mess. So, x, that's the sine function. The sine function can take um, any real number as input. Uh, there's no worry there. Remember, we're looking at it individually. We'll fix this up um, in a bit. Okay, so again, looking by itself, x can take any real number. Uh, no problem with that. Okay, and then g goes from any real number. Y, well, that is the output of the sine function that goes between minus 1 and 1. So y, that goes between minus 1 and 1. Okay. Okay, what about f? f then eats up this value from y and produces a value in z, and that takes the root. Okay, so we're going to take the root of something from y. But there's going to be a problem here. Look at how y is defined. y, uh, as the set here, goes from minus 1 to 1, which includes negative values. We can't take the roots of negative values. Okay, so we are supposed to take the roots of these values. but we can't because they include negative values. So this set includes negative values. So big problem there. We've got this uh, set Y, which is the output of G, but it can't be the input for F because F can't take on those negative values. It can't eat up the negative values. So we've got a problem. So how do we fix this problem? What we can do is redefine x so it's not all the real numbers, but it's those real numbers that produce positive values in y. Why do we do that? Well, we want to remove those cases that give us negative values. Okay, so a fix. We redefine x such that g produces non-negative values, so non-negative values for f. Okay, so that is the uh, fix that we're going to be using. We're going to look at the uh, part of the domain for x that produces positive values in y such that those positive values from y can get mapped with f Okay, because of the roots problem. Okay, so let's draw a little sketch of what's going on and then we'll see what part of the domain we can keep and what part of the domain we need to uh, then throw out. Okay, so just looking at the sine function here. 
So we've got x gets mapped to sine x, and then the sine x gets mapped uh, with the root. Okay, but this first, so we've got something like this, okay, as our sine function. Now we know it has that periodic behavior, so if we just look at a portion of the sine function, we can extend our result to the full, um, the full set. Okay, so this is 0, uh, 90 is the peak there, but we're not so worried about that for now. That's going to be 180, 270 is the trough bit over there, um, and then 360. Okay, um, at the end of this lecture, I'm going to go through uh, a different way of measuring angles uh, called radians, okay, and we'll be using that um, uh, from now on. Okay, but for this example, we'll use degrees because you should be familiar with that from high school. Okay, but um, at the end of the lecture, I'll show you radians, which we'll be using um, from now on. Okay, so from 0 to 180, notice that the sine function is positive. So we can take the output from that portion and use the root function to map it. There's no problem with that. But from 180 to 360, the sine function is then negative. And if the sine function is negative, then from this mapping here, if we go here, the sine function is negative, we then are trying to take the root of a negative value. We can't do that, that's a problem. So here, if we look at the full domain, which is the real numbers, these portions of the domain where it's negative, so these portions here where it's negative, uh, we need to remove those. Okay, those can't be included. So let's highlight that. So here, this positive part we must include, the negative part uh, we must remove. So this highlighted portion in red here, this is the part of the domain which, you, which we must include in X. Okay, everything else uh, we must then throw out. Okay, so I'll just write that here. So x equals, um, I'm going to write the first portion, and then you can fill in the, the rest of the intervals. Okay, so here it will be from 0 to 180. Okay, this portion is perfectly fine. The sine function is positive. We can take the roots of the positive, uh, no problem there. Okay, union, and then the other portion that will be 360, um, and then that other endpoint, and so on. Okay, you can fill in um, the rest of those. So on these portions here, uh, under the, the red line there, those are fine, because if we take an x value from those parts, it will produce a positive, uh, or I should say non-negative value, which can then go into the root function. Okay, so this is x, and then if we take the sine of that, uh, we end up going from 0 to 1. Because notice over these red parts, the, the sine function goes from 0 to 1. So in this case, y, uh, that will be from 0 to 1. Okay, again, because we are restricting the domain, so we're only looking for the range uh, over that particular part. Again, the, the red part there. Okay, now we can take the roots of that, right? The roots of something between 0 and 1. It's perfectly fine to do. There's no negatives to worry about. Um, so in this case, Z, that will also be from 0 to 1. So going from here to here, we're saying Z is equal to the roots of Y. Okay. Uh, or if you want to write it out fully, it's the roots of y, but y is sine x, so it's the roots of sine x, if you're going from x to z. Okay, so from x, if we ignore the y bits from x to z, this will be h, which is f after g. Okay, and this will be uh, roots sine x. So that's going straight from x to z. Okay, um... I hope that helps a bit with the understanding. Uh, let's look at a, another example. 
um, I'll give a little bit of homework and then we'll have a look at the uh, definition of that radians angles um, that I was talking about. Okay, the rest of the composition work uh, that will be done in the Thursday lecture. Okay, so this is just an introduction uh, to help you get started with that tutorial work. Okay, so last bit of the examples. Okay, again, let's go from uh, x to y to z. Okay, again, g first and f. So we take an element x. Let's map it to um, x squared plus 1. Then we take an element y, uh, and we map it to 1 over y. Okay, so there should be a few things that you notice right away. x squared plus 1, um, that's just a polynomial. Okay, we know those are not so bad to work with. We know the domain, we know the range. Okay, they're not so bad. Uh, 1 over y. Uh, alarm bell should be ringing there. So whenever the y is in the denominator, uh, remember it can't be zero. Okay, so the one over y, um, we need to look out for that. Okay, we can't have a y value being zero because we can't divide by zero. Okay, so even before we get started, we should be looking out for those things. Okay, so again, let's define this h of x as the composition, so that's f composed with g, or f after g, if you want to read it like that, of x. Again, by definition, f that's on the outside, and it eats up g of x on the inside. Okay, we know how these bits are defined, so we can write h. This is going to be um, g on the inside, so that takes the place of y, and we have 1 over that. So it's going to be 1 over x squared plus 1. Again, g, that is x squared plus 1, that's on the inside. And now we're taking 1 over that. So it's 1 over x squared plus 1. Okay, please keep in mind uh, what goes where with these compositions. Okay, uh, or if you want to write this... Um, uh, with a few more in-between steps. Uh, F, that's 1 over the inside part, so we can write it as 1 over the inside part. And then the inside part is x squared plus 1, so that's 1 over x squared plus 1. Okay, so if you want to write it uh, with a few more steps, that's fine. If you want to do it in one line, that's fine as well. Okay, so we're looking for the domain and range of this function h. Like we said in the uh, previous case here, sometimes we need to do a little bit of modification to the domain um, such that when we do this composition, we don't run in, into any problems. Okay, but we'll see in this case there's um, nothing to worry about. Okay, so first thing, x squared plus 1. Uh, what can the domain for that be? If we ignore um, the composition and just look at it like that. Uh, x can be any real number. No problem with that. Okay, why? Because it's just x squared plus 1. You can put 0 inside, you can put positive values inside, you can put negative values inside. Um, no problems with that. We can take any real number as the input. Okay, so x can be any real number. Okay, what about the output? Why? Okay, so um, if we map this over with x squared plus 1, uh, if you draw a little picture, we know that it can take any value from 1 up to infinity. Again, if you don't see that immediately, just draw a little picture on the side. Okay, so from 1 to infinity. Okay, uh, what about z now? So we need to think a little bit about this. z is 1 over an element from the set we just found. Okay, so that is the set y. So let's start off with 1. So 1 over 1, that's 1. Okay, 1 over 2, that's a half. 1 over 3, that's a third. Uh, all the way up to infinity. Okay, so we see that there's no problem with 0. Right, at the beginning we were, we were worried 
because 1 over y might be undefined, or so it will be undefined when y is 0. But if we look at this chain here, y is never 0. Why? Because x squared plus 1 is never 0. So there's no worry. Yeah. This mapping from g doesn't produce 0 to give us a problem with f. Okay, again, please just look at this uh, chain of functions here. Okay, so we have no worry with that. So uh, what is the range uh, in this case? So, like we said, we're going to take 1 over 1, that's 1, 1 over 2 is a half, all the way up to infinity, that's going to end up being 0, uh, not including 0. So here we go from 0 to 1, including that. Okay. So, with the help of our intermediate set Y, we can then write the domain and range of H, um, just using this. Okay, so uh, the domain of H. Okay, uh, remember, we had no problem with that. We can take any real number um, as the input. So, again, the domain... It's just all the real numbers, no problem there. Okay, then we mapped over to this intermediate set Y. Okay, we talked about that. And then that mapped over to Z. And we see that we go from 0 to 1, not including 0. So that forms the range of H. Okay, uh, that was from 0 to 1, not including 0. Okay, so if anything uh, is confusing with that, uh, just go back to how these functions are defined. Look at this mapping uh, chain we've got here. So we start from x, we go into something uh, in y, then from y we go to something uh, in z. Okay. Uh, and again, if you, if you have any issues uh, with like the algebra or anything, maybe just draw a little picture on the side. Uh, to see what gets mapped to what. Okay, um, if you still have any issues with that, you can uh, come and see me in my office. Okay, also please feel free to use uh, that Desmos online calculator. Uh, it really helps with visualizing these functions. So you can plot the function g, you can plot the function f to see what they look like, um, and then you can plot the function h uh, to see how they relate to each other. Okay, please uh, feel free to use that um, as a visual aid. Okay, a uh, little bit of homework. Okay, so find f composed with g, f composed with f, G composed with G, and G composed with F. Okay, so it's just mixing and matching how we're doing these compositions. Okay, um, and then we have the following here. Okay, so F, sorry, F, uh, let's say, F of X is equal to X squared. G of X is equal to... Um, sine x. Okay, number 2. f of x is equal to 3x. g of x equals 1 over x squared. Okay, number 3. f of x equals uh, cos x. And g of x is equal to um, sine x. Okay. Okay, so uh, just by the definition of composition, uh, what do these composed functions look like? Uh, so this is the first part of the homework. Um, and then the second part of the homework is to find the domain and range for uh, f composed with g and g composed with f. Uh, for this above question 2 here. So the 1 of the 3x and the 1 over x squared. Okay, so for f of x equals 3x 
and g of x equals uh, 1 over x squared. Okay, so do the composition the one way, find the domain in the range, okay, like we had before. Remember, we are trying to remove the problem points uh, to get our domain. Okay, so always just keep that in mind. Okay, um, and then swap the order, so do g after f in that case, um, and then again look for those problem points and remove them from the domain. Okay, if you need help with finding the range, uh, please just do a little sketch on the side or use Desmos if you need to. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be the uh, homework for today. So we'll go through this um, in the lecture on Thursday and then continue with the remaining uh, material for compositional functions. Okay, so that's it for the lecture on compositional functions, uh, the introductory lecture. We're now going to do a little tangent um, on the idea of the radian measure for angles. Okay, so let's have a look at that. So using radians as an angle measure. Okay, so let's just start off with um, degrees. So we all know how that works. So if we take a circle and we cut it up uh, like a pizza into 360 parts, then if we look at one of the slices, it will be quite small. This over here, this angle, okay, the angle of the, the pizza slice, this will be one degree. One degree. So it's one degree of 360 degrees. So we cut it up into 360 parts. Uh, one of those parts or one of those pizza slices, uh, by definition, that is one degree. If we want some other angle, uh, let's say this much, we just look at how many pizza slices fit into that amount, and that is your angle in degrees. Okay, so the key idea is this 360 part. Okay, now 360 is a nice number. Okay, um, it's quite useful, but at the end of the day, it's an arbitrary number, right? So it has no like mathematical a reason okay, for choosing 360. On the other hand, this other way of measuring angles, called radians, uh, it does have a mathematical reason to it. Okay, so um, it's the better way of measuring things. Okay, so uh, from now on in maths, okay, so my module, the next module, and so on, uh, you'll be using this thing called radians. Okay, so where does radians come from? Okay, it's the same idea. We've got the circle. We want to cut it up so that we can measure um, angles or the angles of the, the pizza slices. Okay, but in this case, we don't use 360 degrees, which is kind of like a made up number. We use something that is more intrinsic to the circle. Okay, uh, in fact, we use the circumference. Okay, so let's imagine uh, we've got our circle over there uh, with radius r. Okay, so what we're going to do now is imagine a pizza slice like this, where the crust part, okay, or the, the cord, if you want to think about it like that, uh, that part there is also r. Okay, and we're interested in this angle theta. So with this setup, uh, this angle theta here, uh, that will be measured in radians. It will be one radian. Okay, so how does this work? So this is just a segment um, of the pizza. It's one pizza slice. Okay, and we're looking at this crust portion from here to here. We said that was R. What happens with the full uh, pizza? Okay, the full crust is going to be 2 pi r, that's the circumference, or the perimeter. Okay, so that's going to be 2 pi r, like that. Okay, so there's 2 pi of these r sections 
going around. So if you want to think about it like that, so two pi, that's our number. So we take our r section, that length, we multiply it by two pi and we get the full length of the circumference. So I'll just put this in quotes. There are two pi sections sections of length r around the circle. Okay, again, that's just from the product here. If one section is length r, then the full length around is 2 pi r. So there are 2 pi sections. Now, this sections here, again, that's just in, in quotes there, this is analogous to this idea of degrees. So here we took 360 cuts around okay, to give us one degree. Here we are going to do it as 2 pi. So instead of 360 degrees to go around the circle, we now have 2 pi radians around the circle. Okay, so though they go hand in hand. 360 degrees around the circle, now we have uh, two pi radians around the circle. Okay, so no, no, not sections anymore. We're now talking radians. Okay, there are two pi radians, much like how we have 360 degrees around the circle. Uh, and there's this one-to-one -one relationship there. So 2 pi, that gives us 360. Um, and with that in mind, we can convert back and forth uh, with any angle. So 180 degrees, that relates to pi radians. We can just put pi. Okay, because that's half. So 90 degrees, that's going to be pi over 2. 45 degrees, that's going to be pi over 4, and so on. We can go back and forth uh, between degrees and radians just by knowing that 2 pi radians is a full circle and 360 degrees is a full circle. Okay. Um, so now with this in mind, we can redraw our trig functions uh, not in degrees, but now in radians. So here, um, let's just draw sine. Okay, so here we have x, sine x, but now um, these interesting points on the sine function we are going to put as radians. So here, this, that will be zero. The peak that was at 90 degrees, it will now be at pi over 2 radians. Okay, the 180 uh, degree intersection here, this will now be at pi. Okay, halfway around the circle, that's pi. Okay, the 270 degree uh, trough bit over here, that will now be 3 pi over 2. And finally, going back to the start, uh, that will be at 2 pi or 360. Okay, so again, there's just this mapping between the two ideas. So before, we had the circle of 360 degrees. We chopped it up to get an individual degree. Here we have a circle with circumference uh, 2 pi r. We chop it up again into radians. So this portion theta here, that's going to be 1 radian. And then going all the way around, that will be 2 pi radians. Okay. Um, so you can always go back and forth like that. Just know 2 pi. 360, uh, and then you can find um, any angle uh, going between the two. Okay, um, so this is for sine. You can do a very similar thing for cosine and tangent um, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that for radians. Um, as we go through with the module and we look at more of those trig functions, um, I'll speak more about the radians.
okay? especially when we get to the calculus section a bit later on. Okay, but for now, uh, please just keep this in the back of your minds that we are now moving away from degrees. We're moving into radians. So if I ask you for uh, the domain and so on for trig functions, please make sure that you specify it in radians from now on, um, not degrees. Okay. okay so um, as always, if you have any questions, please email me uh, or you can come to my office. So tomorrow, uh, that will be Wednesday. Remember, we have the double. It will be in person um, in the lecture venue but we won't have a lecture, we will be going through the tutorial. Okay, but it will still be in the lecture venue. Okay, I will send out an email as well, but please just remember Wednesday, in person, in the lecture venue. Okay, I will be collecting the tutorials um, at the end of that session. Okay, but if you have any questions about the tutorial still, or any questions about the homework, uh, please don't hesitate to email me. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow.